You've done it. Congratulations. You've finally gotten to the end of the course. We're going to show you an overview of all the previous topics we've covered since the start of the first course, 198.1x, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, all the way until the final content lecture of the second course, 198.2x, blockchain technology. This will not only give you perspective into how far you've come in your blockchain knowledge over the course of the last few weeks or months, but it will also give you a glance into the overarching structure of the program, which you may not have noticed before. Everything we're going to go over is just a quick sweep through our past material, so please don't take this as a replacement for the regular lectures or as a content video. Instead, it's meant to give you the opportunity to get a little nostalgic about everything you've learned thus far. This first lecture, Bitcoin Protocol and Consensus, was the first blockchain lecture you watched from our course. It gave you a high-level overview of everything you needed to know in order to understand Bitcoin. We first talked about Bitcoin, which was the first and most widely used cryptocurrency, and introduced you to some of the fundamental ideas about Bitcoin. We then took you through the goal of Bitcoin, which was to replace the bank, and show you how Bitcoin was able to do that as well. We first introduced the idea of identity, how identity on the Bitcoin blockchain is split into the public key and the private key, where the public key is what you use to identify yourself to others, and the private key is what you keep for yourself. We showed you how public keys are secure, even though you generated them individually by making an analogy to a bunch of grains of sand, each with their own earth, with their own grains of sand, a very complex analogy which hopefully you understood at some point. We then looked at Bitcoin's model for transactions, the UTXO model, and showed you how they, like piggy banks, can only be used once. We took you through some of these fascinating demos that demonstrated exactly how the UTXO process works. We explained why information has to be distributed between peers in order to prevent any one person from having control of the truth. We also demonstrated what the blockchain structure looks like and why it was designed that way. Finally, we learned consensus by iterating over various forms of consensus until we reached proof of work, the form of consensus used by Bitcoin. It prevents any one person from voting more than once by tying their voting power to some scarce resource, in this case, computational power. After breaking down how Bitcoin works, we dived into the history of Bitcoin and blockchain. We learned about cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, and the fight for privacy. We examined some early attempts at making a cryptocurrency such as Digicash, Hashcash, and B-Money before finally arriving at Satoshi Nakamoto and his invention, Bitcoin. We saw when Bitcoin was first ever used to purchase a tangible asset back in 2010. Fun fact, 10,000 Bitcoins are no longer worth $81 million due to the recent drop in price. We saw when Mt. Gox, one of the most popular exchanges, was affected by a massive hack. When Ross Ulbricht was arrested for running the Silk Road, and when Bitcoin inspired hundreds, if not thousands, of other cryptocurrencies, leading to hundreds of companies and thousands of jobs around the world. One of the most significant cryptocurrencies which spun out of the Bitcoin hype was Ethereum, aiming to provide a Turing-complete protocol upon which smart contracts and decentralized applications could be run. We also saw when the space was shaken during the attack on the DAO, which led to the infamous Ethereum hard fork. We examined the regulatory, economic, and miscellaneous factors which might cause investors to flock towards cryptocurrencies and also what might cause them to leave. We watched as the hype train grew, visibility increased, and the blockchain space had now bled into everyday conversations. But of course, what goes up must come down. With pushback from governments, many of the average investors started to back out. We then took a look at how the enterprise world viewed Bitcoin and blockchain. Jamie Dimon first said that it's a terrible store of value and that it could be replicated over and over, only to concede later that year, in 2014, that Bitcoin is in fact competition. He then said that no government would ever support Bitcoin because it just doesn't have any control, perhaps showing that he felt threatened. Three years later, in October 2017, he called Bitcoin a fraud and said that if you're too stupid to buy it, you'll end up paying the price for it. But finally, in January 2018, he finally admitted that the blockchain is real, distinguishing blockchain from Bitcoin. We started off with crypto anarchy, cypherpunks, and the fight for privacy, 
saw as the first forms of cryptocurrencies were invented, and then finally saw as large institutions like JP Morgan, the very thing that Bitcoin tried to defy, were now adopting blockchain technology. We also saw various places where the community for Bitcoin and blockchain exists. We took a look at some of the politics surrounding Bitcoin, as well as some of the controversial topics in the space today. We gave a quick primer into ICOs, the hype, and why they're so popular today. One of which being CryptoKitties. We also took a look at some of the huge blunders that have occurred recently, such as the parity hacks and the coin check hack. Finally, after going through some context around Bitcoin and blockchain, we went into the details of Bitcoin in the Bitcoin Mechanics and Optimizations lecture. We taught you about cryptographic hash functions and how they can ensure trust in a trustless environment. We then started to dissect the blockchain, taking a look at the components of a block and at the components of a block header. We took a look at the Merkle root, the summary of transactions, saw what happens if someone tampers with it, and proved how we can show that a transaction is within a block without looking at every single transaction within that block. Next, we discussed the previous block hash, taking a look at how this makes the blockchain immutable, and showing what happens when anything in the blockchain is mutated. Finally, we looked at the nonce, the implementation of proof of work. We showed how mining is like throwing darts at a target while blindfolded. You don't know whether your guess is correct or incorrect, all you can do is try more guesses. We examine digital signature schemes, which show how Alice and Bob can share information and authenticate their messages without revealing any of their secret information. We showed you the connection between private keys, public keys, and Bitcoin addresses. We also showed you how to turn a public key into a private key. We took a deeper dive into Bitcoin scripts and showed you how a script can actually unlock your Bitcoin. We also took a look at the various kinds of payment, one which is paid to public key hash and the other one which is paid to script hash. We also took a closer look at time locks, which allow you to specify a time at which your Bitcoins can be unlocked. Finally, after going through all of those technical details, we showed you how these characteristics manifest in real life. We went through the various types of users that someone could be in the Bitcoin network, depending on their desires and the amount of hardware they have. We went over how you can store your identity using wallets, and the various types of wallets that you have in order to store your Bitcoin. We also gave some specific examples of wallets that you could use. We also discussed paper wallets, hardware wallets, and brain wallets, all of which let you keep your private key offline. We went over some pros and cons for the various types of wallets that you could choose. We also showed you how to get Bitcoins into your wallets. Through Bitcoin ATMs, exchanges, or decentralized exchanges, there are many different ways in order to do so. Additionally, we showed you what simple payment verification was. We also demonstrated multi-signature transactions. We went through a demo of how Derek, Rusty, and Gloria can all come together to form a multi-signature wallet so that no one person has control of all the funds. These multi-signature wallets could be used between peers, yourself, or even with a company so that even if one of your keys is lost, at least the company can help you recover your funds. We went over some best practices such as never reusing your pseudonyms. But the problem comes when storing all of these keys. One way is to use the JBOC or just a bunch of keys style of wallets. However, this is expensive because you have to store every key pair. On the other hand, you could use hierarchical deterministic wallets or HD wallets, which are much better for storing large amounts of keys due to its recursive structure. We then went into an overview for mining about the various steps that a miner needs to do in order to make profit. The first step being downloading the entire blockchain, then verifying transactions, creating a block, finding a valid nonce, broadcasting that block, and finally, getting profit. We went over why miners do things for profit. Lots of profit. The equation breaks down to this, the block reward and the transaction fees making up the revenue, and the fixed costs and variable costs making up the costs. 
we took a look at the various kinds of hardware that are used by miners in order to mine, starting off with CPUs, then GPUs, FPGAs, and finally, ASICs. We took a look at some examples of mining in real life, from Chinese ASIC mining farms to some examples of ASICs that you could buy yourself. We also examined the problem of decentralizing mining, because in practice, one CPU, one vote doesn't seem to hold today. We talked about the requirements of a puzzle to make it satisfactory for a cryptocurrency. We took a look at ASIC resistance and about memory hard puzzles which could possibly deter ASICs from being used to mine. Specifically, we looked at Scrypt, a hash function used by Litecoin and Dogecoin. Broke down the pseudocode in order to understand why it was so special and also looked at some of the other various mining algorithms, such as X11, X13, or even a periodically switching mining puzzle. However, the conclusion was that no matter what mining algorithm you choose, there's really no such thing as an ASIC resistant algorithm. We also discussed some of the pros and cons of ASIC resistance, a discussion which you took part of in our forum boards. We also looked at redirecting the work that's typically wasted in proof of work on something known as proof of useful work. However, we discovered that proof of useful work does not actually work. We took a look at the various ways in which changes are pushed through the Bitcoin system. We looked at Bitcoin Core, the team of developers in charge of the main Bitcoin repo. We took a look at hard forks and soft forks, how these are used in order to update the blockchain. And finally, BIPs, used to make proposals within the community. After looking at how Bitcoin manifests in real life and all of the details that made it happen, we then started to discuss how to destroy Bitcoin, all of the ways in which you could attack Bitcoin from a game theory stance. We then looked at pool hopping, a way to maximize your rewards at the expense of the pool managers. We also looked at pool cannibalization, a way to distribute your mining power among all other pools in order to make more profit than you would if you were mining honestly, and even went through some examples that demonstrate how this is profitable. If we were to take this a step further and model pool cannibalization as a game, we see that it actually ends up being the case that all pools are incentivized to attack each other, even though they would have made more profit if neither of them had attacked. We also went through the double spending attack at a lower level, examining exactly how Gloria could double spend on Rusty. We went through the idea of confirmations, which allow Rusty to be more secure, but also showed the circumstances under which Rusty cannot assume he's safe. This showed us at the blockchain level how 51% attacks allow someone to control the entire truth of the blockchain. We went through blacklisting, what happens if one person tries to censor someone else, and how much hash power they will need in order to successfully censor someone. We looked at punitive forking, which is what works when you have more than 51% of the network hash rate, but we also examined feather forking, which is a way in order for someone with less than 51% of the hash power to actually be able to censor someone by using the incentive structures of mining to their own advantage. We then took a look at selfish mining, a way for miners to hide their blocks in order to get a head start on mining. And we showed how selfish mining ends up making consensus more difficult for everyone, because whoever's selfish mining is able to get higher profits. We looked at some of the various defenses against selfish mining, such as tie-breaking and publish or perish, but we saw that each of these defenses has their own caveats that prevents it from working perfectly. We then took a look at the Bitcoin network and how attacks can be done by manipulating the topology or network latency in your favor. One could spawn nodes in order to affect the topology of the network even though their mining power is the same in order to attack the network. In addition, someone could have a lot of dummy nodes that are trying to sense the movement of a block around the network. And finally, after fully dissecting Bitcoin, we got into Ethereum and smart contracts, learning how the special properties of Bitcoin were used in order to make this new platform for smart contracts, defining what a contract was and a smart contract was, and then finally comparing Bitcoin with Ethereum. We looked at the various types of accounts on Ethereum and examined how these contracts are compiled down to the Ethereum virtual machine or EVM code. We saw that Ethereum replicated a distributed computer, 
where every node executes the Ethereum smart contracts and then comes to consensus on the new network state. This is similar to how in Bitcoin, everyone was the bank, except in this case, everyone stores the state of computation in Ethereum. We also examined gas and fees in Ethereum, which prevents someone from being able to send infinitely looping code to the network. The gas is what fuels the contract execution and prevents denial of service attacks. Each transaction is then translating the block state, gas, memory, and other inputs into a new block state and a new state of gas through the EVM. We then looked at some basic use cases for smart contracts, such as smart assets, multi-signature wallets, and proof of existence. We compared that with the centralized solutions that we know traditionally. We posed this important question at the very end of this lecture. Why is using a blockchain better than a centralized database? That concluded the first half of the course.